Hey, Lauren, how are you? Hey, Bobby. How's it going? Where are you? How are you? Where am I? Yeah. I'm in Georgia. Are you... Georgia. Are you traveling back or are you just staying in Georgia for a while? Uh, I'm quarantining currently in Georgia. I was doing my best to travel back. I grabbed my car because I was like, you know what? I just don't know um, how long this quarantine is going to last. So I think I'm going to drive home to Louisiana. And I didn't get very far, but, you know, it is what it is. (laughs) I, I saw where you had to announce that the uh, the tour was going to be postponed. So when did that decision get made? Um, we made that, gosh, that was um, maybe the Grand Rapids show. So, like, I think the 13th, 12th, something like that of March, we had to, um, it was kind of one of those moments where it was like hour by hour. Like, we'd get a call from the CDC They'd say, we're going to postpone all events larger than 1,000 people to for the next two weeks. And then it was like, for the next month. And then it was like, for the next seven weeks. And they just kept pushing back, back, back. And so, um, yeah, we're not, I don't know the exact dates of everything quite yet, but we're not canceling, which is good. It just means we're just having to move it all. Have you talked to your family at home? I was, I was watching this morning that New Orleans is really struggling. Like, they're one of the real hot spots now as far as, like, New York, L.A., Chicago, New Orleans with coronavirus. Have you talked to... Yeah, because of daggum Mardi Gras. Right. We have... were all down there having a good old time, and then everybody got the daggum <laughs> virus. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny. I told, I told my friend the other day, I said, you know why New Orleans is the next hot spot it's because we we're a culture that just loves being with people we love being around each other we share everything it's like come on inside i got a cup of pot of coffee oh you need a different cup you know what i mean it's like we're just very communal and um it's so vibrant the culture is so vibrant and so rich and so alive and um so it makes sense to me as to why it would be the next next hot spot people don't really stay away from each other too much but i have some friends down there that i've been calling pretty much every day facetiming every day and just saying all right how are y'all doing how's everybody holding up and i one of my friends was like we decided to stay home and we're building chicken coops and we ordered chickens <laughs> and and seeds and stuff i'm like of course there you go <laughs> new orleans quirk i love it what was lafayette like growing up for you uh, I love Lafayette. It was um, very rich in, in culture, and um, whenever I was a kid, it was, you know, my grandfather, he'd put me on his feet, and he would teach me how to dance, and then, you know, you'd go into all the Zydeco rooms, and people were playing the washboard and the accordions, and it's generational, you know, passed down from one family member to the next, and I think that says a lot about our culture. It's very... Where I came from was pretty hippie, honestly. Like, there were a lot of people that, um, it was like where the oil field and art collided. Like, Lafayette is a city with a lot of oil, a lot of business there. But there's this, like, kind of sect of people that, you know, make everything from scratch and play music all the time and create. It's very creative. Um, People are always you know, creating festivals and different things like that just to bring people together. And I remember as a child, we we had this thing called Festival International. And every year, um, Lafayette would host this. And it was was named one of the world's largest free festivals. Um, And I think uh, over 100,000 people or something would come each year. But... um, the beauty of it was it was this celebration of culture. And so people from all over the world would fly in and perform, like, their traditional, like, African dances, like from the Congo or, you know, certain things from South America and Canada, lots of French music. And so it was really diverse and really beautiful um, to see Lafayette, like, celebrate something so, so um unique honestly and so i think something about growing up underneath that musical influence um it really inspired me and kind of 
I would say that was probably one of the most influential things I was a part of as a kid. I think culture. I think I like a lot of people that that are listening to this show right now probably started to learn of you in the last couple of years. Like we were kind of late to the Lauren Daigle train. And, and I think you and I talked about this at one point. I knew of you because Keith Urban was like, hey, you should listen to Lauren Daigle. Like he told me that and then he came on my show and said that uh, as well. So when I started to look up some of the early stuff about you, comment on this because I didn't know this. It says, Lauren did not consider music seriously until contracting a debilitating illness. She claims it was one of the best things that happened to her. What, <laughs> what is that little block? Of, what, what happened there? Okay, I don't know how... how debilitating it quite was, you know. That might be a word that was expanded upon, but um, yeah, it's actually, it's true. When I was in high school, um, I was diagnosed with this virus that put me on homebound for about 18 months, and um, honestly, I went to a college preparatory school. It was very academics-driven. Um, I knew I always wanted to sing. Like, growing up, they'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, I want to be a singer. Because I would love listening to, you know, Whitney Houston and Celine Dion and these women that had these powerhouse voices and stuff. And I'd sing all over the house and make up melodies or whatever. And it was, I guess, about my eighth grade year, ninth grade year, when it was kind of like, okay, but what are you really going to do? Um, and I remember my my grandfather sitting me down and saying, okay, come on, what are you thinking of? What do you want to do? And for some reason, I just adopted that oh, I can't really do music. Like, that's just some pipe dream. I'm going to go into the medical field because I love anatomy. I love biology. It's fascinating to me. So um, I end up kind of in my mind thinking, I'll probably go into something medical. Well, right as I started kind of gearing my world for that, um, I ended up getting this illness. And because I was home, um, I would just sing all the time. Like, I... It was basically the only thing that I could do that wasn't that allowed me to dream and allowed me to create. And um, my mom put me in voice lessons because it wasn't too hard on my my body and kind of kept me out of depression and or helped with it, if you will. And so, um, yeah, I really is it became therapy for me. It became like just a source of healing during that time. And because of it, I feel like that's why. I, I sing the songs that I do now. It's because if I walked through something that was difficult or painful, isolating, lonely, um, maybe I can make music that inspires someone who's walking through that same situation, you know? At what point, though, when you're singing, do you realize, well, I'm actually really good? And I don't mean that in a funny way, but when did you realize that you were better than even the, the local contemporaries for you? So, okay, this is funny because I, I feel like I've really struggled with confidence for a long time as far as if I was good or not. Um, my mom would hear me sing all over the house, and she went to our choir director at church and said, my daughter sings, I have no idea if she's good or not, but if you like need someone on the back row of the choir, please call her. And he said, come on around the back of the church. I want to I wanna see what you sing like. And he had me sing this song, and I was really sheepish about it. And he said, Lauren, I've heard you sing. Like, I mean, I've heard you laugh, and so I know that you can you can belt. And I was like, okay. And so I just went for it. And he said, get ready, because in two weeks, you're going to start singing that song in church. And I remember in that moment feeling like, man, okay, this is kind of exciting. This is like a shred of hope. Maybe I can do this. Well, then after a couple months of singing at church, Everybody did the classic, you got to go on American Idol. So I went, I tried out for American Idol, and um, that was in Atlanta. And I remember there was 10,000 people there, and I got a golden ticket after all those 10,000 people. And so that was kind of when I was like, huh, well, am I only good for, like, my little community, or am I good for the state, or am I good for the country, or am I good for the world, like, how do you measure this? And I think going on American Idol uh, gave me a boost of confidence, but I got cut at the point where you can go on to the, um, the live shows. And so that was 
me having to wrestle, okay, are you going to actually believe in yourself a little bit? Um, and I think I went back home and I started singing in random bands and stuff. And uh, we would sing cover gigs all over the, the city. And I went to LSU and I took voice, you know, with LSU. And there were just so many things that I think slowly but surely started building my confidence along the way. Um, and so I would say American Idol was one moment. And I was like, huh, maybe I, maybe I actually have a voice. And then um, another time was um, whenever I was getting signed by the record label. Um, that was another moment that I was like, is this a joke? Like, is this really happening? Am I really good? Am I, like, good enough for a record label to invest in? Like, there were all these questions, um, but they were, and so they were kind, and it helped grow me, and now we're here. And you know what's so funny, Bobby, is that I feel like there are so many different stages in this industry. You know, there's so many different moments, and um, sometimes you feel like, wow, how am I getting a chance to be here? And sometimes you're like, I've got to keep working hard so that I can get to the next spot. And I feel like the that push... Um, makes me want to keep learning. So even though I'm in this phase that I'm in right now, all right, well, what qualifies me to go to the next level? Or how can I um, train myself? Or even in times like the quarantine, like learn something new that is going to keep me excelling um, to reach the, the next bar, you know? I feel like that quest and that journey for, okay, well, am I good enough for this? Or do I have potential here? Um, I think that's probably going to exist in me till I die. And I think there's something really, I think there's something good about that. You know, you bring up American Idol. It's my, I've been working on that show for three years now. And what I talk with him about off the camera, you're one of the examples. And I used to, one is Hillary Scott from Lady A, who's a, a, who's I'm close friends with. And the other one is you in that it's never an on camera moment, but it's an off moment to tell people just because you didn't make the show means you just weren't right for the show. It doesn't mean that mm-hmm. doesn't mean you're not good. It doesn't mean you don't have your own style. It doesn't mean you have your own thing. You just weren't right for this one little lane of a TV show that's happening right this second. And so, you know, your story is one. Did, did you try it more than once or did you just do it one time? I did. I tried out. Uh, so the first year I tried out, I made it to the end of Hollywood week. Second year I tried out, didn't even make it to Hollywood. It was brutal. Had the flu. And then the third year, made it to the end of Hollywood week and then went to Las Vegas. It was when they were doing that. And then I got cut after Las Vegas. Wow. Three times. And that, and it, isn't it wild? You're here now. And I think you mentored last season or the season before, right? Yeah. It was amazing last season. It was honestly one of the most exciting things I, I had done in my career so far. I told Lee, my manager, I was like, I would do that any day like there is something so surreal about just encouraging someone who's at the very very beginning of their journey like I that I can understand why you would go on the show and kind of like be a voice for those people because it's it's exhilarating and there's so much potential behind these people it's it's amazing to be a part of it did you always set out when you started to go I can do music did you just always set out to go down the Christian lane No, it's funny, whenever I was sick, like back in that season when I was really sick, I would always say, God, I'll do music, but I never want to sing Christian music. (laughs) I, like, did not want to be a part of that at all. One is because I did not want my friends to make fun of me. Um, I I was so against that. Two is just because I wanted um, something sonically different, and I didn't know if what I, like, what I really loved would fit that format. Um, But I knew that the hope that I was given when I was sick, because, like, I would have these crazy dreams. Like, I thought I was having cabin fever, like, losing my mind, you know. Um, But I would have these dreams. And um, while while I was at home, and it would be of me on stage or within a word or, Part or song or whatever, and they were so vivid and so real. 
Um, and then, like, years later, when they actually started happening, I was like, oh, my gosh, these are these are those dreams that I was shown, like, when I was, like, 15 and 16. Um, and so I, I think the hope that I was given during that time to just hang on. And I would research all, like, so many stories about different actors or business owners that went through a really hard time. Um, how did they overcome it? How did they use their difficulty or the obstacle um, to be kind of a platform in which they launched from instead of like the space that overcame them. Um, And in that, I found just so much hope in Jesus. And so I remember saying, I don't want to sing Christian music, but I want to sing music that brings hope to people. And then the first record label that called was a Christian label. And I was like, well, this is an open door. And they've been so kind and They've been such great partners the entire way. It's been wonderful. You did mission work too, right? Um, a little bit. I went to, I feel like I do more mission work now, which is funny, but I went to um, Africa once. We went and visited some hospitals. And then I went to Brazil, helped build a church when I was like 18. Um, but... And then went to Tuscaloosa when all the tornadoes came through and helped clean up and do things like that. One fun thing when I was a kid, though, this is pretty awesome. My um, my parents are just, they're people that would just give the shirt off their back, you know. And Katrina came through and wiped out New Orleans. Well, we were in Lafayette two hours away, and so a lot of people in New Orleans came to Lafayette to kind of seek refuge with nothing. I mean, they had nothing. And people think that the quarantine is is intense, and it is. And it's, I was telling a friend how similar to Katrina that, that this quarantine is because we had no waters, no water in the, um, you know, grocery stores. All the gas was out and things like that um, just because so many people were trying to get as much as they possibly could. Well... Um, my parents went and made these huge pots of gumbo and brought us down to the red light district as like, you know, kids, we were probably 10 years old, maybe, and um, brought us down to the red light district and we served gumbo. We would go and knock on all the motel doors and say, see that table down there? There's free gumbo down there. Come on down. We got potato salad and gumbo. We'll serve you. And so you'd see all these people just coming out of there hotel rooms, motel rooms, whatever. And um, it was so special just to see such a diverse and unique group of people coming together over food and in a time that everything felt chaotic and wild. And I think that that built love for humanity inside of me, you know, in a way that sometimes words don't. Sometimes you have to experience it um, like that, like where it's really real. So, yeah, those are some of the mission stories from when I was a kid. You know, I'm always curious about when songs start to cross over because it happens where I come from, a country, and, and I've worked in other formats too, but when your song starts to cross over and go from big in the, the, the Christian world and Christian radio to pop radio, how wide does your reach get and how quickly does that happen? Yeah, that was wild. So... Uh, it happened very organically, honestly. Like, whenever whenever I put out Look Up Child, the record, um, I didn't have a mainstream label or anything like that to kind of cross over, cross the record over. Um, and You Say was on Christian radio at the time, and then uh, main, mainstream program directors would just start playing it. And a lot of the program directors that I talked to said, their wives would come in and say, I heard this song on Pandora or Spotify or whatever. Can you play this on the record? I just love it. I just think that you would love this, and I think people would love it. And it was a lot of wives, honestly, that, you know, got it on there, which is really funny. But um, so organically, they started adding the song, and after that, I was like, okay, well, we got to get a mainstream radio team. So... We signed, it's kind of funny, we actually signed to the record label after it was already starting to get 
onto the radio, onto mainstream radio. And the difference uh, when something like that happens, it it takes it from one one people group and spreads it so far and wide. Um, and you know the craziest thing is when you're like you're in Europe or you're in all of these random continents, countries, and people are singing the words to your song so emphatically, like in a way that I'm like, oh my gosh, these these people have lived with this music. They have absorbed this music as their own. And um, I think that's what's so profound about crossing over is the numbers multiply pretty intensely um, as far as the amount of people that you're, you're able to reach. I was looking at some of the stuff you were, you were uh, talking about, and you talk about the price fund, which I think is very interesting. Uh, would you talk about that for a second? Wh- which part? The price fund, which is uh, the, school, oh, yeah. the school lunches. Yes. Oh, that, okay, so this sweet girl who works on my management team, her name is Liz, and she said, Lauren, there's um, a lot of things going on with these kids who um, aren't, they're, they're used to getting lunches every day at school or breakfast every day at school, um, and now that school is being shut down temporarily, you know, they don't have a way of getting food. And um, there was this picture on, uh, I follow this Instagram feed called NOLA News, and um, NOLA News posted this little girl, she's like three years old, and it said, uh, we're a family in need, anything helps. And like the caption was the mother had just gotten laid off from her phlebotomy job, um, and they were just trying to get anything they could. And, you know, if that is going to be the shape of the world, um, I want to do everything I can to just help people in a moment of crisis or concern. And um, thinking about those kids, I was like, yeah, there's absolutely no way that we can't help them. So I'm pretty pumped. People were really generous. And I think a lot of times, you know, people get scared in times like these. People are unsure in times like these. Um, but to see people say, you know what, I'm not going to let like the fear control this. I'm going to still give and help people that that need it, you know. And so I'm so excited. I, I don't know quite yet what number we're at, but I know it's it's been going really well. Well, it's great to finally talk to you under weird circumstances for sure, but I'm glad you're safe. I hope you're able to get home. They're starting to put restrictions on people crossing state lines now. You can't, I know. You can't even yeah. go from Louisiana to Texas. Not that you're trying to go to Texas, but because of the amount of – coronavirus in louisiana they're shutting down that that trip to tech you can't get into florida now so i don't know if you got a map wow. with you but you may have to do some like get out of the car run across the border but i'm talking about state yeah. borders here yeah back road action yeah i know all about that <laughs> well lauren great to talk to you be safe uh congratulations on everything everybody can follow lauren at lauren underscore daigle and uh hopefully i'll see you around town soon lauren when everything's normal thanks bobby thanks for having me all right bye lauren Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey guys, it's Bobby Bones. Welcome to the channel. If you're new to the channel, subscribe and then go check it out. A lot of artists, a lot of songwriters, a lot of music. Welcome to the Bobby Cash channel.